This conference will now be recorded. So, welcome back, everybody. Uh, good to have you in here. Uh, glad we have a quorum today. Um, just a quick agenda. Um, some uh, just want to take you guys through some of the last findings regarding the immersion requirements. Uh, there's one slight, one important discussion topic that came up, uh, which I just want to um, validate with you guys. Um, and a couple of questions I have regarding this, regarding the qualification checklist. Um, and I would like to discuss on next steps with this uh, requirements group uh, because we're about to publish this uh, revision 2.1. Uh, which means that we can uh, put a focus on the horizon again and uh, see what the next steps are that we want to go through. Um, anything anybody wants to add to the agenda or specific that anybody wants to bring up for today? And I'm just going to give it a few more counts. Oh. Okay. Okie dokie. Now let's uh, start then. Um, I've received a very limited amount of feedback. Uh, the feedback that I have received most related to small, really minor textual modifications uh, or adjustments or clarifications, which I've just processed. Um, I don't find them meaningful enough to go through. It's just adding an etc. somewhere or uh, including uh, an item in a scope or uh, so the, they were so minimal they don't change anything to the uh, underlying principles in the document um, except for one uh, that was brought up by Brian from Fuchs um, and I just had a quick chat with Jessica on this one uh, in the immersion requirements, we are requiring uh, the dielectric constant measurement at 20 to 40 gigahertz. Whereas the fluid specification uh, also includes a 20 megahertz value. Um, this is something that we have covered in the past and we have discussed uh, also with the harmonization of the documents. Um, and I just want to rerun this by everyone. Uh, the fluid spec can have more uh, values than the requirements document. The requirements document is setting the absolute minimum requirements that everything needs to comply with. 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz are also specified in the fluid specification. Is there a reason for us to also include the 20 megahertz or uh, is there no added value to it uh, in this case? The reason for, for listing specifically the 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz range is to ensure uh, uh, compatibility with the high frequency communication which we're expecting in, uh, in immersion and that's something where these values are important for. So um, if there are any thoughts, uh, and this is the only open point that has come up or the only point for us to discuss uh, regarding the, the, the content of the requirements, I'd like to gauge um, the floor here and see if there's anybody who wants to, wants to comment. Yes, please go ahead. Um, this is a rod. Uh, so in Signal Integrity Workstream, um, Basically, like you do, you do like a range of a spectrum till 40 gigahertz. But um, lower frequency, it depends on the like a uh, fluid. If the fluid, uh, the electric constant uh, stays constant across the frequency range, then it shouldn't be a problem technically because really um, it wouldn't change. But in some fluids, for instance, if you look at uh, some of the Novex for two phase fluids. At lower frequency range, the, the, the electric constant is higher, then at higher frequency range, it will drop. Um, whether low frequency testing really low, the, low, would have an effect on anything, like um, that's, the, that's the part that I don't know. Uh, 
Does it make sense? Yeah. So it so, does have an effect, but at the same time, um, it all it might not be really. It doesn't. It might not have a direct effect on the communication. So we would be looking for multiple values, right? Uh, here, because it states um, uh, you need to have the, uh, the the current requirement states you need to have this test done with five volt AC at 20 gigahertz at 20 degrees C, 40 giga, gigahertz at 20 degrees C, 20 gigahertz at 70, de 70 degrees C, and 40 gigahertz at 70 degrees C. And those are t basically four values that need to come out of this test. I would I would remove the 5 volt AC, like um, because the electric constant measurement is usually with a probe, and uh, the probe is uh, connected to an instrument called a vector network analyzer. Um, I'm not sure even, uh, it, this might be a different type of testing method, but the electric constant in most of the fluid manufacturers is just used by an immersion probe. So there is a beaker, there is a liquid, the probe goes in and, and you do the measurement. That's like um, more yeah. straightforward, like common measurement. So I would even I would remove the five days. Yeah, I would be very hesitant about putting that up up on a table now because we've reached to this we've reached this specification after about a half year of discussions. Um, uh, so uh, revisiting the five volt AC is something uh, that I'm I, I don't like to remove that because that opens the door to to many more discussions again. And this was achieved together with okay. UL and input from Intel and, if uh, and a broad community, okay. right? If it's uh, very, if it's already discussed, then um, you can ignore yeah, or dismiss my comments. No worries. Yeah. Very extensively, and, and it finds it, it finds it roots in in in, tip, in the existing spec uh, for the six to two four six uh, IEC spec, which is typically designed for higher voltages. Um, and it's here to the five volt AC is here to define uh, um, a voltage that is much lower than what. Uh, most of these uh, standards are uh, applied for, applied to. So, but the question that came up is the discrepancy with the fluid specification, which is uh, provided by Intel, which also includes a 20 megahertz. And we do not have that listed here. So, uh, Brian, Brian sent me sent me the details on that. That and um, uh, Brian, are you are you in the call? Yes, you are. I did finally make it. Yeah. So. So, so is, is this up? Can you, can, yeah, can you please provide the background why you brought this up? Because uh, then I don't have to have to read up, read out your email. Yeah. So the big thing is, is that is that um, we had a hard time finding somebody to do Intel's fluid specification testing, and then when we got to someone that knew what, how to do it, he gave us seven gigahertz which would not meet this requirement but meets the 20 megahertz the 40 gigahertz and when i questioned him on it he was like well it doesn't change so you know we're fine right he also probably didn't do it at 20 and 70 c so or any and same thing he said it doesn't change much so so one of the things is is that is that we're we're asking for in this case we're asking for eight points two by two no four points um four points yes four, four points, points right four points and that's and if they don't change at all but but that's a that's like to get that's just to get in the door as a minimum requirement and then the spec that intel's which is super servient or subservient to this has a different spec and so it just means uh, more testing, right? Actually, actually, the spec is uh, in sync. The only difference is that Intel has also included a 20 megahertz instead right. of gigahertz. So, uh, Dave, uh, Intel also maintains the 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz, but they've added the 20 megahertz. And the temperature variations are also in the Intel spec. Right, exactly. So. Um, and so it, it's only, and it's because of trying to gather the data to make sure we understand what's really happening. And there, and there's a value to that. 
but the idea is that they're not you know how is that playing out in terms of working because basically when we got done the guy's like hey it's there's no changes with all this because he knows right because he's tested so much stuff he's like it does it doesn't matter and it's not very perfectly repeatable like the variability that you see isn't going to be perfectly repeatable so so there's also that aspect of is this is this becoming a um a test that's not that's like hard to hit if we have a requirement for it right yeah um so those are some of the things that i mean I, I, that's some of the things that i see is that i'd like to figure out how to get a test that i can do not just at one place in the u.s but at many places that they understand how to do it and we all are happy with the results because we all understand that it represents something but i i know this is a new industry and it's 20 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz matters you know so yeah and all the temperatures matter <laughs> so it's just one of exactly. those it's one of those things of just how to deal with how to deal with getting over improving our understanding with this level of testing so that we can take it out of the requirements right it's kind of where we have what we need to get to if you want to open it up to yeah. more things coming through this process so the, historically the problem is that for the signal to, signal integrity measurements the methods that are currently described in existing standards uh, are mostly applicable to high power to high voltage systems and with fairly low frequencies uh, in terms of uh, aimed at grid power yeah right uh, and that has no relation to the intricacies of how to make a chip communicate with another device uh, with another chip at, uh, at at these incredibly high speeds uh, and this is where yeah you do see signal integrity issues uh with uh, certain variations uh and that's where that's where this uh this back comes from uh so this bandwidth or these two values were initially also uh, uh brought in by intel and undescribed by uh most of the solution vendors and uh and and uh, the it specialists in, here in this uh in this community um so what I was, what I'm mostly looking for, is there a discrepancy, and is there something that we're, do we need to add the 20 megahertz or not? Because the 20 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz values, uh, we've discussed that over a period of the of the last one and a half year. And so I, I, I agree, and and I agree that the these. <laughs> Uh, labs will be widely unfamiliar with these tests simply because, and that's also what we recognized in the notes, right? Uh, hey, this test doesn't tip, doesn't really exist yet in that sense. There's yeah. no existing test standard, so we uh, that's how we define, okay, let's use that uh, 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 this particular test standard as a as a basic outline, but change the parameters to this, and then you should get something that is of value. Uh, Puny, please go ahead. Yeah, so I support uh, that harmonizing the OCP fluid specifications to requirements as well, because that was one of the things that we kept in mind. And and also, um, there would be some reason why uh, they started with 20 megahertz as well, right? So there may be some applications uh, where it is not high speed, uh, you know, signal uh, requirements, but maybe there is application where they are actually honing onto this uh, low frequencies. Um, and also, I think to uh, Arat's uh, comments about maybe some fluids have issues with uh, high speed, maybe they are defined for low frequencies. So I think to keep that as the same, a benchmarking between the specifications, I feel I think 20 megahertz makes sense here to be added into, into this table. I think that was a very reasonable expectation to harmonize uh, what we have already done, and then we want to do the same in this uh, also. So reasons for, I just want to highlight uh, the thought process behind how, uh, omitting some of the items in the fluid spec. So the immersion requirements are minimum requirements uh, and the fluid spec has explicit requirements for that fluid spec. 
from what I recall, and please somebody uh, uh, somebody speak up if 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 you feel that what I'm going to say now is incorrect. But from what I recall, is that 20 megahertz is typically not a concern with signal integrity. The signal signal integrity issues are are more are a concern when you get into these higher frequencies. Which is why we've adopted these specific frequencies in the immersion requirements, as opposed to uh, the additional uh, uh, the additional values. I'm just pulling up the fluids spec uh, to pull up a table for the uh, the inter the spec requirements. So, oh, so yeah, my, my inter yeah, my interpretation, Rolf, was that the requirements documentation has a list of a, a, a very long list of desirable measurements so that everyone can understand how the fluids work, and then a small minimal set of requirements as delivered and over life as to how you what you expect the fluids to do as the the minimum that you have to meet so in a sense the requ the requirements table that we're working on is like we desire these specs and the minimum requirements is we require these specs now what it actually what this table uh, requires any fluid uh, manufacturer to do is to disclose these values for new fluids yep and these uh, these values have nothing to do with a lifetime specs, right? This is just this is what you can expect from this fluid when when you when you take it out of the drum or out of the when you receive it uh, before you start using it. Correct. Right? And, that, and these are the values that need to be disclosed and part of the uh, technical data sheet so that uh, other parties can can evaluate the performance of the service systems uh, beforehand. Right. Can the I minimum add values? Um, 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 just, honestly, like yeah. there should. Go on. Go ahead. Um, I think if 20 megahertz needed to be added, there should be a very clear justification from Intel why they want that. Because a lot of even the electric probe kits, they their starting frequency measurement goes from 200 megahertz. So unless it is a specialized tool, it's not gonna be a broadly adopted method of measurement because people have to then go find a special probe kit that will be able to measure that frequency range. And I can tell you from experience, um, most of the, the electric probe like kits that is already being used, it starts from 200 megahertz or 500 megahertz. So, and goes up to like 40 to 50 gigahertz. Um, so I'm not saying, 200 megahertz shouldn't be added what i'm saying is that if it is possible there should be a, like a comment why 20 megahertz is needed so i'm not saying not to include yeah. it but if it's going to be included there should be a clear justification for it because a company then needs to like go actually buy like uh, and invest on an instrument that is not a common instrument and there should be a justification why it is needed Uh, and I can I can agree with that when it comes to the spec, but we're not evaluating the specification here. We're evaluating the minimum the, the requirements, and the requirements are disclosures. And the Intel fluid spec has already been passed. This is an existing specification, um, and that is something that uh, should be brought up with the authors. And I don't disagree with with what you're saying. All I'm saying is we. Uh, there is no discussion that we can truly have here about whether the 20 megahertz is uh, should or should not be in the fluid specification because that's not what we're uh, uh, currently discussing in this group because that the specification is already out it's already published and been approved by the community does that I make see, sense but I, even I, like I, the I probe that they you. mentioned I, here yeah. like the Keysight N151A dielectric probe kit, that dielectric probe kit starts from 200 megahertz. So um, it, might be, it might be a typo, like it was actually 200 megahertz and they um, 
Mr. Zero? No, it, no, I believe it was intended as 20 megahertz, and that relates to uh, uh, but the 20 megahertz. So I think what they intend to do here is to build a curve with that data. Uh, so if you look at the actual spec overview, is that the uh, the dielectric constant measured at these three intervals uh, should not exceed the given values, and that's what they're that's what they're looking for, and that should be evaluated at those three temperature points. That is not that is something else than what we're discussing here in the immersion requirements. In the immersion requirements, we want to, we are defining what are the minimum disclosures that need to be in place or the minimum uh, fluid properties that must be documented, and that's where uh, that's where we are. Uh, less uh, impactful with the requirements than the fluid spec, simply because we only have two of the three values here that we have deemed uh, explicitly necessary. Punit, yeah. you were part of, uh, you, you basically oversaw the whole harmonization process as well, right? So it, it, am I saying anything uh, that might, that, that you feel might be incorrect? Because I'm doing this from memory as well, right? So. That's why I'm bringing this up. I just want to make sure that we're aligned here. And Punit, you're on mute. Ah, there you are. Can yeah, I think I can't I now. Why? So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I can. We yeah, can hear so you. So I'm saying is. Yeah. So what I'm saying is I'm not uh, trying to add anything new to this, but it's already been done. So um, as part of the minimum requirements, I think. You know, to just to bring the same uh, concepts between those two uh, published documents, it just uh, I, I believe at least uh, 20 megahertz mentioning there makes sense. But then we need to, that basically means that we're going to expand the, the disclosure requirement from four points to six points. Can I have a clarifying question? Yes, please go ahead. Is this document is supposed to summarize the requirements for the current companies that could be using these fluids? This requirement is summarizing the necessary disclosures, not necessarily fail, not, 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 not necessary failures, but any kind of fluid that wants to be, uh, that seeks uh, any positioning or recognition through OCP or any compliancy with any OCP specs uh, must comply with these values. And the compliance here is not uh, a quantitative compliance that you need to need to meet certain a certain specification value. The requirement here is the qualification criteria here is that these values are disclosed. So that they're disclosed according to the OCP requirements. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, there, there is no value. There is no value that uh, disqualifies or qualifies these values, except for uh, a small handful of values that are listed in the minimum dielectric fluid requirements, which state uh, minimum dielectric strength, uh, volume resistivity, um, the flash point or the ignition point, sulfur content, acidity, and odor. Those are minimum spec values that the requirements document uh, recognizes, but the rest is only focused on disclosures. So these values must be present on a technical data sheet. And the 20 megahertz is only required by Intel? That is only required in the Intel fluid specification, which is a specification by itself that has quantified values. To comply with the uh, uh, the point here is that let's say if uh, Microsoft wants to publish their own fluid requirements for their purposes or their own fluid specification for their purposes, they may choose different values that they want to want want fluid manufacturers to comply with uh, before they can work with specific fluids. Uh, and whatever they put in their requirements must meet at must uh, uh, meet at the least the minimum specifications we provided in the required 
uh, value table, like uh, dialectic strength and volume resistivity, etc. Uh, but it can use any given value uh, for any of the other uh, fluid properties. And I may even bring in uh, a taste property uh, because hey, that's, that, that doesn't conflict with the requirements, right? So hmm. the requirements document is like an underlying uh, uh, quality uh, requirement that just makes sure that certain data is provided and certain uh, 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 certain safety aspects are met. Okay, so I would suggest we not make the change if the 20 megahertz is not in any of the OCP specification requirements and it's only an Intel requirement. And this is a summary of OCP specification requirements and I would suggest we not make any changes. Uh, I want to turn it around because it, the Intel specification is an OCP uh, is, is an OCP published document, but it's uh, there can be multiple fluid specifications. Right now we only have one, but there can be ten. Technically, the thing is that all the fluid specification must must comply with the immersion requirements document, not the other way around. Um, so the immersion do you know who the? Yeah, go on. Um, Rolf, do you know who was the contact? I'll follow up offline regarding yep. this uh, with Intel let's, to find out. Let's uh, Sandeep. Sandeep was the per okay. Yeah, uh, he's the main. He's the he primary uh, uh, spokesperson for this, uh, and uh, he's one of the authors. So I've just okay. put on the screen. Um, I hope he he he'll take. But he, what I can do is that I can follow up to get a clarification on the 20 megahertz, uh, okay. if that sounds reasonable. So uh, since there are some different different opinions here, um, uh, I would like to put it to a vote uh, whether we should include the 20 megahertz or not include it in the requirements document as a required disclosure. Unless anybody has any any further questions on this, uh, I suggest we just go through a roundtable vote. Okay, no suggestions. Uh, Puneet? I suggest to include 20 megahertz. Okay, Aisha? Hi, Rolf. It's, it's not very clear to me for the need, so I would say not to include it. All right, very good. All right. Um, I'm against it, and my justification is the current probes available in the industry start from 200 megahertz minimum. Very good. Brian? Yeah, I'm against it. I think it's good as stands. Uh, then I have caller 01. I don't know who you are because your name doesn't show up. Um, that's me, Chris Fletcher, with BP. I all right, suggest you not. Okay, Joshua. I will abstain. I also want to note, it looks like there is an instrument that uh, has a, uh, an additional impedance analyzer that will go down to, to 10 megahertz. That looks like it's a key site instrument. All right. But you abstained. Very good. Kelly? Yes. Um, I'm also going to abstain. I think we need some more clarification from Sandeep for right. the rationale. Um, I've listened to the argument or the, the, the discussions back and forth, but I, but I think we would need to get his input um, before making a call. Very good, Chris. I'm the caller uh, here, one. Oh, right, sorry. Okay, uh, Hal? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm going to abstain. Same as well, all right, that's a shame. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I'm going to go uh, right now against not adding it just because uh, I yeah. just I don't see the rationale for it. So very good. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't see the first name, uh, but what I do see on the screen is uh, Margegi. Uh, Rani, yes. Forgive, yes. forgive me if I'm if I'm if I'm molesting <laughs> your name. <laughs> um, no, no worries. My name is Mariam. 
so oh, hi, I'm going to go. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so I'm going to go against it. All right. Um, Nick. All right, no audio from Nick. Uh, Scott. Also the audio, uh, William Intel. I would vote affirmative at this point. I, I will also follow up with the uh, with Sandeep and, and Jessica on uh, the justification. Yes. Affirmative uh, meaning uh, in or out? To include it for now. To include it. Yep. Okay. Uh, And I abstain at this moment. I think uh, the uh, this parameter is important, you know, for um, high frequency measurement, but uh, the performance uh, measurement. But I think I hear the de debating, and it seems uh, it's not uh, clear uh, on this point. So I abstain here. Okay. So. That means that the nodes have it, um, and I will not make the addition at this point. We can reevaluate for a future release. There is no impact on this because it's just a requirement less, but it doesn't mean that the fluid spec doesn't already require it. Uh, so, just want to state one more time: the fluid, uh, the uh, the requirements document is something that needs to be qualified against and that contains only things that uh, mostly things that are not performance related. The actual fluid specification contains quantifiable values. Uh, so any fluid must meet both require uh, must meet both the requirements document and the fluid spec and have the requirements document typically will not contain any explicit values, only required disclosures. So there's no impact by not including it. Um, and therefore we can keep it open for discussion uh, towards the future. So with that, that's out of the way. We've had a vote on it and it's on the record, which is fantastic. Um, it means I can close up this document and pass it on to the incubation committee for acceptance. And that means we should have this published uh, well before the global summit. So congratulations, everyone. That is the requirements document. Now, accompanied with the requirements document is also the qualification checklist. This is the checklist which, uh, uh, which I've built um, and it contains the qualification items for every requirement. Um, the intention here is that uh, any product or specification or uh, best practices or guidelines that co that are created regarding uh, something that touches upon immersion needs to be qualifying against this list. Anything that applies. Right, so if there is a fluid manufacturer who wants to get recognition for being uh, for meeting OCP requirements, uh, and on top of that, maybe uh, may or may not want to get recognition for being compliant with the fluid spec, um, this checklist should be used. Uh, most of these requirements on the checklist relate to the immersion solution. Some of them relate to the fluids. Uh, and regarding the disclosures, uh, they, can, they can be filled out on this sheet. Um, I've already received some comments, so I made, the, I made some improvements. And by filling out the sheet, uh, generating an automatic uh, technical data sheet, uh, essentially, right, containing all the values that are filled into into the specification sheet. Um, Brian, is it okay if I share the sheet that I have partially filled uh, for the figure of merit uh, analysis? Sure. Yeah. All right. I'll put it on screen then. So I've received some sample data. Uh, obviously, it's not a complete set of data because a lot of fields here are not showing any values yet. 
but the reason why I've asked for some sample data is because I wanted to get an idea of how the figure of merit figures would come up, would show up in graphs, and whether I could extrapolate a formula to calculate figure of merit figures for any given temperature. Reason for that is that the Intel fluid spec requires uh, uh, or needs to have a value, a measurement value of 25 degrees, which is not part of the immersion requirements. Um, so to help and facilitate that value, uh, I wanted to analyze how the behavior of figure of merit numbers and whether I could come up with a formula to count, to approximate a value at 25 degrees Celsius or in that case uh, for any given value. So I fed that information into this table and uh, Brian, I haven't processed the, uh, the comments that you provided for the sheet in this particular table, but as you can see, I did add them to the official spec sheet. So the uh, standards are now listed here as well in this uh, in this overview. Uh, but coming back to the graphs, um, so based on this data, I can now extrapolate a formula for figure of merit one. However, that is something that I don't necessarily like to do based on a single fluid. So it it would really help me if I can get some more data from other fluids to do the same kind of calculation or the same type of modeling. What I've found out for the figure of merit two is that it is not a really nice curve. And I'm curious, Brian, is this indicative of, of a measurement, a potential measurement issue somewhere? Or is this, do you know if this is a normal behavior for figure of merit two? I do not know. I genuinely don't know. So I'm, that's why I'm, I've been asking for some sample data to work with. Is this something that you're aware of, uh, Brian? Not, um, not directly. I mean, if you look at how it's calculated, there could be something that's driving it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, when I looked at it, I go, oh, that's wig wigglier than I thought. But it's, uh, it, it is what we have right now for the data. So. Um, and even on um, another fluid that I didn't send you has a, is a little discontinuous in that respect also. It could be the way that um, how density is calculated. You know, the density measurement has more variability. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to, I think one of the things to look at is that sort of what's the first order differential sensitivity for each of the parameters that are in that calculation. And that's how you can figure right. out what's yeah, so the thing that I wanted to establish is, hey, is there a linear uh, relation between the different temperature uh, variations, uh, or is it a curve? Like you see in figure of merit three, based on the same data, that is clearly a curve. Uh, figure of merit one seems to be a, a, a straight line. However, if you look at the deltas between the measurements, you can see that, it, that the deltas are declining when you go up in uh, in temperature so technically it is curving a bit uh, what i would like to find out is some trends on how these figure of merit numbers are behavior uh, are behaving with different types of fluids different fluid specifications and uh, uh, so that i can uh, so that i can eventually build something that resembles a formula uh, to come up with a dynamic formula to come up with intermittent values so that, that's what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, needed before publication, uh, simply because I haven't received any input yet. Um, and Arad, I, I know you're in the call, you are part of the volunteers to provide information. I haven't seen anything from you, so I'm hoping that um, you might be able so to. I'm talking share. to our infrastructure team this week. Hopefully I'll have some feedback from them. Yeah. yeah, so here you, here you see why, I, why I'm looking for sample data, right? Because th this is something that might be of, uh, of help to all of us to, sit, to discover if there are uh, indeed trend lines uh, that, we can, uh, that we can use to, uh, to make our lives a bit easier. 
Rolf, this is Mariam uh, from Petrocanada yes. Lubricants. So I can provide some sample data if you would like. So yes, please, and I would like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, if, if you send me the table that the the properties that you need, uh, so I, yeah. I, I can try. Yeah. I, I, I will send you this file, uh, okay. and basically what I need is to have uh, this sheet populated as mm -hmm. as as good as possible, but at the very least with the values that matter for the figure of merit calculations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, yeah. so that, because that's that's what is built on. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So in looking at our data, the thermal conductivity was the was the value with the greatest variation or the, the next wiggliest curve. Um, but I also know the other thing that, the other comment that I got from the actual lab people was, there is one test that is not done at 20C, it's done at 25C and the instrument doesn't have a cooling capability. So getting a 20C measurement is, um, I, virtual right it's it's calculated so um we could see some things like that at the between 20 and 25 c because of some people with the instrumentation had to do that i can try to get more specifics but that person's out on maternity leave in germany which is sure uh, going to take a while so, so the figure that seems to be off is a measurement at 50 degrees because that's where uh the 50 degrees seems to be lower than uh, and causing, causing the curve here, right? Oh, yeah, sorry, 40. 40 or, uh, it's 40. Either, either 40 or 50 or 60, but probably 40 or 50, because uh, if 50 is to, if 50 would be lower, then you would get a more straight line, at least yeah. up to the 60 value. But uh, that that is assume that is only anticipating uh, a nice correlation or linear correlation or somewhat linear correlation between these values, right? And I don't know if that is the case or something that we should be expecting. I I'd leave it, but I know who made made the measurement and she's really good. So, Akuni, where do you stand? Uh, is this something that you? you're able to help out with uh, from Shell point of view? Yeah, I can uh, provide the information. Bro. That would be really helpful. And again, also to you, you can see why I'm looking for it. It's not so that I can collect and share or create a database. Uh, this is only about com trying to figure out how these values relate to each other, right? Yeah. All right, fantastic. So. Um, I think uh, that's it. So I don't need those values for uh, the publication of the fluids uh, spec. The checklist uh, is pretty much uh, done uh, and evaluated. So I'm going to close that up now as well. So I've, I've removed uh, uh, the, the notes in the top and I'll accompany this with the uh, uh, with the requirements for the incubation committee to evaluate. Unless there's more questions or comments that you guys feel that we need to go through. But I think that we can close this up. Everybody's quiet. Very good. And I'll wrap that up uh, right after this call. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. So I'd like to do uh, to open up the floor for discussion on next steps. There's a couple of things that uh, the requirements uh, community should be involved in. First of all, there's the FMEA study, which uh, Amy and, uh, and Rick are, uh, are heading or should be heading anyway, um, where we will be providing some support. Um, that is something that Punit and I are going to pick up on. Uh, do you guys have specific topics that you feel that we, as a requirements team, should be looking at uh, going forward?
And uh, this is the moment where uh, I would love to see all mics open up and everybody trying to speak at the same time. Yeah. So, Rolf, I was talking to you about um, the sort of the monitoring techniques for um, fluid performance. Yes. And um, there's a there's a little bit in hinted in that in it in the requirements document and in them I think in one of the other documents. Um, but what is what's not clear to me is um, what people do and why today um, for measurements. Like I've heard. I think it's a great question. Month, every two months, some people do a lot. It, they didn't specify specific things they measured, you know, in, in sort of just off the cuff discussions. It's not, um, my, it's just trying to figure out like, what is it that we should really be looking at to Good monitor? Question. So from my point of view, your question, I, I think your question covers two domains. Um, one is uh, what should be uh, measurement intervals for for fluid quality, and the second is what are the what are the quality items that we'd be looking for, and what would be uh, the type of things that to uh, to which extent should you be able to uh, to do quality checks uh, as an end user? Is that correct? Do I interpret that correctly? That would be fair enough. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Um, so I personally have quite a few thoughts on that, um, but let's start with uh, with the group here. Does anybody uh, wants to uh, respond to this question? Ooh, the silence is deafening. Okay, I'm happy to go first. Um, first, when it comes to the frequency of testing, um, there is. There is no OCP guideline on frequency of testing. Uh, vendors have uh, typically have their own uh, uh, suggested routines towards their end users uh, or their own best practices, whether they're doing uh, just the samples from a tank from an installation or whether they do specific, uh, whether they take samples from every tank that is deployed uh, and they have their own interpretation of appropriate intervals. Um, I think it would be good if a guideline or a recommendation could come out from the fluid manufacturers, to be honest. The reason why I, I think that is the most appropriate uh, source of such directions is that a solution vent, a solution provider for an immersion solution uh, typically should be concerned about the tank or the construction or the quality of the materials of the solution itself. The IT manufacturer or the system integrator is typically responsible for the IT equipment. Um, and often when you're talking, especially when you're talking about larger installations, the fluid manufacturer will be supplying the fluid directly to the end user. And it's not necessarily sold through a, through a system integrator or, uh, uh, or the solution vendor. Uh, one of the reasons why solution vendors are typically are often not selling the fluid uh, in large quantities is because they don't want to be a chemical distribution company. That's my experience. Uh, I know that you all have your respective experiences with your respective uh, fields, <coughs> but when it comes to quality management of the fluid, uh, also the server manufacturers and chip manufacturers, uh, manufacturers are primarily looking at the fluid manufacturers when it comes to setting uh, requirements to the fluids. Um, so I would like to bounce that question back in a way to the broader community. Personally, I, I do have preferences for how often something should be measured, uh, and I would say at least once a year. Um, 
uh, preferably maybe every half year, uh, whether that should be a single tank sample or something else. But I feel that those kind of guidelines should actually come from the fluid manufacturers who have the fluids in the field uh, and who would be building up a database with information on how these fluids behave over time. And that's something that typically only the fluid manufacturer can do for their own fluids. Does that, does that make any sense? That's, that's my two cents at least. Don't consider me the authority here. Brian? I think it makes sense, um, Rolf. I think another aspect to consider is, um, you know, if you're thinking about the, you know, how would you do the testing, some sort of remote monitoring might also be helpful um, in terms of how the testing is, is done rather than maybe having somebody take samples. Maybe there's some sort of element of remote monitoring as well. Yeah, I agree with that um, as well. So there's been talks about f monitoring fluid quality uh, real time. The problem is that uh, the sensors, I'm familiar with a few sensors that can do specific measurements. Um, but when it comes to measuring dielectric constant, for example, or the dielectric strength of a fluid, uh, that can be a little bit more complicated to figure out and to harmonize. Um, yeah. And that's in my experience, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty, a pretty ex, uh, exceptional field of expertise, as well. But I might be mistaken, and not ju just not being, I might just not be familiar with uh, that part of the industry uh, enough. Yeah, there is a. Um, I know there are flow-through cells for dielectric strength. Um, that could probably be uh, be implemented somehow, but I don't know if logistically it would make sense to have a whole bunch of those, as that would add up to you know a pretty significant cost pretty quick. Well, exactly, because if you if you're going to measure dielectric strength, you will also want to measure the viscosity and 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 other fluid properties that you need to monitor over the lifetime of a fluid right yeah um i don't know like in the uh industry that i am typically being you know other dielectric fluids um viscosity is not something that's tested often as it doesn't really typically change much over the lifetime of the fluid and they're more looking at other factors that uh, that do change over time, such as dielectric breakdown strength, or you know the power factor, dissipation factor, all that um, moisture content, those things that actually do affect the performance. Um, viscosity, typically, from my knowledge, does not change that much over time, at least for the fluids that I deal with. Yeah. So, are there sensors that we can? Uh uh that, that we can find or that we can uh uh potentially even recommend to use in immersion systems yeah yeah absolutely um I, I think that anybody that makes a dielectric breakdown instrument has the capability of building one that is also flow through so it, i don't think it's you know much of a technical challenge more than it is just in you know engineering something up or uh drawing it up whatever um i i as far as i know i think that i've only seen one flow through cell on the market and it's typically built into um like fluid processing trailers you know uh for uh servicing you know whenever they're processing large amounts of oil it'll be going through a uh through a rig and they're constantly checking that dielectric breakdown through the flowing fluid um i don't know if there's if that's a huge market right now but obviously um with where this market is going it could become a much larger market and probably many vendors would step into that spot um for other tests i don't know of any uh dial or i don't know of any dial or 
sorry, uh, like power factor um, flow through cells or anything like that, where it can perform over, you know, many different immersion tanks or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever solution you're looking at. Um, trying to think of any of those others tests on there. I think the dielectric breakdown strength is probably the easiest one. Um, I, I don't know if, um, yeah, I can't think of any of those other tests that would have a, a cell that could work over many different instruments or many different, uh, tanks or something like that. Um, acidity of, um, the liquid can be measured. I know TMG core has a patent on it. Um, that uh, basically like, for instance, like if you have something like a uh, Novak 649, like that could it react with water and um, change the pH or create some acid. So um, there are, but like typical standard uh, from what I understand to the best of my knowledge. And again, I'm not a tank manufacturer. Like I'm not for a company that makes that tanks. Um, Usually for getting accurate measurement, you need to actually do samplings. In-situ in situ measurements are going to be limited um, because the samplings that happen on the liquids is mostly uh, to see like what is dissolved uh, in the liquid and like uh, how much impurities you get, um, mostly due to material compatibility. So maybe like um, some in-situ measurements can be done just to check the um, like I, I cannot comment on like how much you can get just by implementing sensors in the tank. Um, tank manufacturers probably will have a better insight to comment on this. Um, does it make sense to schedule a brainstorm on this uh, for next uh, for next requirements call? I think this is a topic that is. Uh, that may have interest, uh, that may find some interest in the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's worth going forward. For, for me, the thing that I see is, is I see a lot of unknown and uncertainty in the contamination listing without any priority yeah. or timing. And I've brought this up before, and, and probably if you listen to enough recordings, you'll hear me say priority and timing. <laughs> uh, but the, but, that's what I'm concerned with because there's a there's a lot of fear around that at the end user level that we need to like we need to start editing back what we do, not adding more stuff that to be concerned about, right? And yep. and and I'm not saying that we're doing we did it wrong. I'm just saying that if it's wrong, we should be able to remove it as an issue. And so yep. um, we need Agreed. to figure out how to get out of those things. I mean, I personally, water, I get it. Let's keep monitoring water in the in the oil. That's fine. But um, the other things, I, I'm not sure, right? And, and um, OK, so I'll schedule the, uh, I'll, I'll put it on the agenda for the next call. And uh, we should be able to dedicate the majority of the call on that. Uh, let's, I suggest that we do uh, that we go through the list of properties that we, and, and determine the, determine the ones that we would like to be able to measure in real time versus uh, reports or testing cycles and uh, and then we, we we can probably define uh, a roadmap on how we can come up with um, uh, with some methods to uh, to implement measurement methodologies to uh, at, at the very least to uh, see if we can uh, build some kind of a baseline to help the industry forward because i agree we need to get rid of the fear of the fear out of the industry and in my experience that is typically done by providing information and insight and, and transparency um and that's something that we can provide with that approach that's right in my wheelhouse so i should be able to help a lot on that Okay, so uh, I get, we're over time already. Uh, so I thank you all for uh, joining and uh, we'll make sure to focus the next call on uh, measurements and thanks Brian for the uh, uh, for the suggestion on this. Uh, I agree with the necessity uh, regarding the measurements. So good timing. Thank you. Till next time. All right, people. Good luck and uh, hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes, bye.